Hello and welcome to the second evening of the RTS Thames Valley Centre's Technical Colloquium. Real-time cloud processing is delivering untold opportunities for broadcasters and we are proud to have two people who can talk a lot about this. The first one is Ethan Kovacs. He's the Senior Cloud Media Engineer at Sky. He's going to walk us through their cloud-backed sports recap product and how they are using applied AI and ML in partnership with their Comcast colleagues to produce and serve highlights in real time across a multitude of sports, clients, and territories across the Sky, Comcast, and MBCU family. The second person speaking is Dr. Rob Oldfield. He is the co-founder and CEO of Salsa Sound. He is going to be talking to us about real-time cloud audio production, and we'll be covering the new opportunities that can be realized with cloud native audio processing, including immersive experiences, personalization, increased automation, and AI data mining for metadata creation. So let's hear from Ethan. Well, thank you to the RTS for having me along for this one and welcome to my um, talk about uh, AI-based sports highlight creation. So we'll focus on ground to cloud. Um, before we get into the world of sports recap and what we're doing there, just a quick intro about myself. So hi there, I'm Ethan Kovacs. I work as a senior cloud media engineer at Sky in their group product division and I'm working within a team known as Innovation and AI and we're all about uh, products and services that directly impact our customers' experience. Um, I'm personally responsible for media engineering across our development teams and I've been at Sky for just over five years now with a background in broadcast infrastructure, supporting our DTH platform and now I'm in the world of cloud media engineering. But enough about me, let's talk about Sky Sports Recap. So what is Sky Sports Recap? It is a AI driven automated sports highlight service and it offers our customers a live companion experience so that allows them to catch up on the latest in-game action alongside the live action shortly, shortly after it's happened. So whether you're a Premier League fan and you've come late to a game and you want to catch up on the action from the first half, or you're an F1 fan and you're watching the race, you want to catch up on something that happened in practice or qualifying, this is the product for you. It's offered added value in the, in the COVID world for our sports customers, and we've designed it in a way that it is suited for any big screen or mobile device client across the Sky, Comcast, and NBC Universal Group. It's brought real-time autom automation into the content production space, which might, you know, more conventionally use manual methods. And we personally consider it like quite a brave adoption of um, ML. It's, it's a risk that's had its challenges, but it's offered its return on investment. And we'll explore why today. Um, and so you can see what Sports Recap look, look, looks like. Here's a um, promo. For those of you watching F1 on Sky Q or Sky Glass, then Sky Race Recap allows you to quickly catch up on all the key moments from a Grand Prix weekend. So if you join late and have missed any of the action or simply want to go back and watch the best bits once again, then you can. All you have to do is hit the red button on your remote and select Race Recap. A timeline of events will appear that you can navigate through, including the start, overtakes and all the crucial moments. So whether it's before, during or after the race, Sky Sports F1 is the go-to destination for all the best F1 news, views and action. So I mentioned the Premier League earlier and you saw the uh, F1 promo there, but what other sports are we supporting with Sports Recap? So football's our main sport, it's our carrier sport, and we're supporting the Premier League in the UK and US, the EFL in the UK, the Champions League in Austria, and Bundesliga 1 and 2 in Germany. We're also covering cricket. We quite successfully covered the 100 tournament in our UK territory last year, and we'll do, do so this year. And prior to that, we have done um, a proof of concept using uh, international test cricket. We also cover golf. So we covered the Masters and the Open in our UK territory. And you saw it there, we're covering F1, and that's across our UK and German territories. So where will you find us across what territories and what clients? So in the UK, you'll find us across all of our flagship products, and that includes SkyQ, our DTH offering, SkyGo, our OTT offering, and SkyGlass, our new flagship product. In Germany, you'll find us across SkyQ and SkyGo. And in Austria, you'll find us across SkyQ and SkyX, which is their OTT offering. 
and we've recently branched out to the US, so with our colleagues at NBC Universal onto their Peacock platform as well over that. I think it's quite important here to touch on like um, scalability in terms of hardware and software. So we you know, successfully launched in the UK and we were quite easily able to then scale that into other territories like Germany and Austria on the basis of that we're using similar hardware, similar software over there. It literally was a case of a lift and shift across and then they were able to plug their devices into their back end and start enjoying the same service that was so successful in the UK. So what about scalability? So since our inception, which was around mid 2020, we've covered four major sports across four different territories and we've delivered highlights to five different types of client device. Football is our most popular sport and it's kind of like our carrier sport of the platform and that is at a point now where it's fully automated. So there's no manual creation there. It goes away and it does its thing. And as a team, we're always looking to expand our support for new sports, new territories, new client devices. And right now we've got quite a conquered process for expanding existing sports in this manner. So what might a week in the world of sports recap look like? So if we look at our peak sports season, we can have like a Premier League game on a Monday night, a Champions League game in Austria on Tuesday and Wednesday, a EFL game thrown in there as well. And then when we come to the main action, so the weekend, you can have multiple Premier League games, multiple EFL games. You could also have a whole F1 race weekend in there as well, as well as covering Bundesliga 1 and 2 in Germany. If we then throw into the mix there as well, so golf season, so in April you can have something like the Masters or the Open going on as well. Um, alongside that, so that's a four-day event. And then if you switch that out for cricket season, so in August you can have something like the 100, which is like a month-long cricket event uh, going in parallel as well. And I think it's quite important here to touch on the fact that, although I've represented these as individual things, if you take something like the Premier League, we can have a lot of concurrency there. So last day of the season, Sky might be showing like 10 games, and we'll be producing in an automated fashion highlights for all of them games at once, and they'll be delivered to all the customers viewing them games as well. So I've touched on our key recap, like core offering there, but what other additional experiences are we offering our customers? So in Germany, we have something called Sports Hub Max or Minor Conference, it's known locally, and that's an extension of our sports recap product. So it combines that core offering with real-time notifications across multiple simultaneous games. And as a customer, I get a whole new experience. So I can go in, pick my main game, and I can toggle what matters to me across the other games, get enable notifications, I sit back and relax, watch my game. As things progress in them other games, goals or key events, I then get a call to action that I can jump across into them games and view that action and then return to my main game. This right now has initial support for our D market only, and it's just covering Bundesliga 1, but we do have planned expansion there in due course as well. And I mentioned earlier, we branched into the, the US with our colleagues at NBC. So they have we have a new product there called Peacock Explore, and that's um, that will be covering the Premier League, and that will offer the same core um, recap offering, so the key plays that you can jump into and go back and catch up on that action. Um, so yeah, that's coming very soon. So how does all this uh, come together and work? So if we just run through this flow, so we'll start at number one, and that's an event happening in the real world. So that could be something like Liverpool scoring a goal. That will then, we'll then have an external data provider that records that and adds that to a data feed. Then working with our colleagues at Comcast, they consume that data feed and then push that to our Comcast math team. And the math team are uh, the media analysis framework team over there. So they're like the equivalent of us at Sky in the Comcast world. The Comcast math team then consume this data feed, but they're also consuming a live video feed from us. So they um, run this against like ML models and then produce a new set of aligned data, which is then sent to Sky. So we ingest that new set of data into our back end and we send it off to a curator specifically for that sport. So that's broken up by sport like football and F1, etc. When it gets to that creator, the creation service then extracts what is needed. So it'll ensure things like um, there's a high confidence that a goal is actually a goal and it can even go back and enrich what it has got there from the data provider with even more, more data. After that, we say, cool, we're good to go. So we, we invoke our sports highlight service and we create a highlight and that's then registered. Then we move on to generation. So that will then, the sports highlight service will then invoke our clipping service, and then that will actually go through the live to VOD workflow. So harvest the content. It can also do things such as like stitching branded bumpers for that sport or intros to the start of the clip. 
Then once that's done, the, the asset's been produced, it can then be published, so it'll be lobbed onto an API for, for the client devices to come and collect. Um, and then, yeah, the client device will interact with that API, get the VOD clip and play it back for the customer. And just so you can see the end result here, I've taken an example. So this was Crystal Palace versus Liverpool in the Premier League. So that was January the 23rd of this year. So this ended with 23 clips, um, effectively. And this would have been a stitched highlight tool that you're seeing here has been like split up just for this purpose. But you can see here that what is, you know, what has been produced is fit in the brief entirely. You know, a goal is clearly showing a goal. And this was this was all done in an automated fashion and delivered to our customer as the game game progressed that day. So what about AI ML? What are we doing there? So AI and ML we know could be quite challenging to implement and it has like quite big obstacles to overcome, but as a team, we've been successful, so how do we do it? So I think it's important again to point out our colleagues at Comcast, we've plugged into quite an established AI and ML platform that they have over there. And now more commonly working as part of like co-development between our team at Sky and them at Comcast, we're um, doing a lot of development of like upcoming news detectors and features. So just as a high level of what we're doing, so we're using OCR, which is optical character recognition to extract things like the game clock and the score from, from the visual broadcast. We're also doing things like scene detection, so via image classification to recognize then key visual elements of the broadcast and extract them. And then development is currently going on to that co-development between Sky and Comcast, which is gonna be using a mix of computer vision and deep learning to extract even more further events that we can then give to our customers in the form of a highlight. And in all cases, whatever we do with the AI and ML um, technologies, we can also back this up with uh, actual data by a callback to a data provider to get that. So what about media processing? So in all cases, we're ingesting mezzanine grade streams into our AWS cloud for processing and analysis. And we're taking the territory specific streams to offer the correct customer experience once it works through our back end and produces that VOD highlight. And what I mean there is like for things like F1, it's actually the world feed. So wherever you are in the world, wherever, you know, whatever broadcaster, visually that will look the same. But obviously in the territories, we're doing things like adding commentary, adding the correct language, etc. So you could argue that for something like F1, which we're doing across the UK and Germany, why don't we just take the UK feed and replicate the same thing um, across to there? But then that wouldn't give them customers the experience that they have like come to come to expect. So we take in both and then we use one as a source of truth and then replicate that to the other feed. And it means that there's two sets of highlights produced and the customers in each territory get the right um, highlight they'd expect. Um, as far as like media processing in the cloud goes, we're using quite well, quite heavily using the AWS Elemental portfolio of like SaaS media solutions, and the solutions like that were really key in our quick time to market because you know right from like inception in mid twenty twenty to now. Um, you know that is allowed that quick spin up. You know we've become huge users of that now. Or, you know, we're really based on there. Um, so yeah, it's been it's been very important. And you can see from the architecture here, this is kind of like a rough high level flow. But any VOD highlights that are produced are served to our client via API. And there's a dedicated middleware that each client device can interact with to come and collect their VOD highlights to play back. So I mentioned earlier that. It hasn't been easy. So, what kind of challenges have we encountered with this? So, challenge number one is obviously automation. This is a you know AI based automated highlight service, and I keep saying it, but football is our kind of like our main sport, our carrier sport, and that is a point now. It's fully automated. It goes away and it does its thing. It doesn't need someone there to create anything. Um, but for sports like F one and golf, they follow more of an assisted production model. So, creation is needed, but most of the effort is more focused on decision making rather than clipping and what I mean there is the case of things like F1 you might have crashes they get clipped up but they shouldn't really be out there so we need someone there to come and remove that at this current point um, and that option of having a split model of you know creation or live manual clipping has allowed a quick time to market because we didn't have to wait until we were like fully in the same position as football and it allowed us to get out there and give that value to our customer. And that's really important to us because that fits our team scrum values. So we're learning from a working product in an empirical fashion while delivering value to our customers. 
Um, challenge number two is addition of new sports. So supporting a brand new sport can be quite a complex process and take you know quite a bit of time and work. But we've got to the point now that we've conquered an easy addition of new leagues to an existing sport. So once that main sport is tackled, so you've tackled like a league of football, you can then repurpose a lot of elements to expand to other leagues, for instance. And that's both on the ML and back end platform side that we can repurpose elements. You know, for instance, that live to VOD workflow I showed you in our media processing section. That is the same for all sports, regardless. So that you know, you don't have to start from scratch there. So development is still required in some cases, you know, in the ML and back end side of things. But the shared foundations moving forward allow a lot, a really, you know, a quicker, easier, and easier turnaround. And the key that we found is kind of stay agile, launch early, don't be afraid of that, and then learn and iterate while it's out there giving value to your customers. And then that allows you to constantly improve your offering. So F1, for instance, um, the season started in March. We weren't going to be ready till August, or that's what we kind of like for. Um, but we got out there. We, we got something out there early, and then we developed through the season rather than waiting to that point where we were fully ready as such. And then with cricket, it was one of the first things we did in this team was launch a proof of concept in under a month. And um, we took a lot away from that and learned a lot that's kind of shaped the service to as it is now. So getting out there and just doing it takes, you know, has been, you know, key to us to um, develop this service. And challenge number three is latency. So this is one of the most important factors in terms of end customer experience, you know, in the industry is, is huge. And you know, for something that is touted as a live companion experience, it's even more relevant and it grows in relevance as we expand, you know, to more territories, more clients and even expand the sports and we get more high profile. You saw on that diagram earlier and you saw on the flow, that there is a lot of like touch points from different people or different teams that are adding, you know, small bits of latency. And it's a really key thing for us to get that down and make it as minimal as possible. And last year we did do a really big, well, a good job of reducing that and cutting some of that out. And we, you know, continue to, we'll continue to do so as we move forward. It is, is a key priority for us. So what's next for the world of sports recap? So I'd love to show you a slide here that shows our roadmap. It's pretty exciting, but unfortunately I can't do that. So what I can tell you is though, is we've got a packed out roadmap and that includes support for new major sports, expansion of existing sports to new leagues, expansion to new territories and new client devices within them territories, um, implementation of new ML and automation methods to get even more value out of the content and produce more highlights for our customers. And alongside our core offerings, we've also got some completely new features and functionality you want to bring to customers as well but maybe you're someone there right now who is a user of uh, sky sports recap and you've got some cool ideas or you haven't heard of this before and this is the first you're hearing but you've got you've got something you'd really like to see on this so if you do please reach out be we'd be really happy to kind of see what our customers are wanting around this so what's some of their takeaways so could this replace people is probably one of the key questions and i think it's fair to say yeah you know in the case of football, that is going away, it's doing its thing. You know, I, I mentioned about the Premier League last day, there's so many games there and it's producing all them highlights up for them games and delivering it to their customers. And um, yeah, I think that's pretty impressive. And the quality of what we're producing, is it suffering because of AI ML? I think it's fair to say, no, it's not. You know, the sample I showed you earlier of them four clips from that stitch timeline, um, they're fitting the brief. You know, a goal is a goal, a kickoff is a kickoff. It is showing that. And that would that is not suffering because it's going through AI ML rather than someone manually doing it. So um, no, it's not suffering. And maybe you're sitting there as thinking, I want to do this. How accessible is this for, for me as another customer? A company to do this um, you know hey Sky can you make it open source and probably say you know no to that right now just because there's a you know the element of maintaining it and we're obviously continuing to develop it um, but there are some things out there that can allow you to prove the concept to your business if that's the thing you're struggling with you know AWS um, at reInvent launched something called the media replay engine and that will allow you to do highlight generation and use a lot of the key AWS services and if you wanted to do something like that you could then prove that value to your business and then um, either build on top of that or start from scratch and build something yourself so it's definitely worth checking out if this is something you want to go go into um, but thank you very much that is all for me thanks for having me and please feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn to um, discuss any of this so thank you very much Hey everybody, welcome to this uh, talk on audio production in the cloud. I want to run through some 
opportunities I see, some challenges and hopefully some solutions and uh, a, w a real world sort of applications of what we can do with audio in the cloud. But before we start, just uh, an introduction to who I am. Uh, so I'm Rob Oldfield, founder of Salsa Sound uh, back in 2017. It's a spin out company from the University of Salford and we're super passionate about immersive audio and automatic audio production. So we've patented a few AI driven tools that are, are um, creating content automatically and providing tools for people to do it so that they can create immersive, more cinematic, more engaging mixes for, for people. And what we're essentially about is storytelling. That's our mission. We want to do it better, we want to create better stories and allow creatives to um, make content that better engages with their fans, whether it's a sports club or a broadcaster. So putting fans closer to the action on the pitch by bringing all of those on pitch sounds out, but also closer to the fans in the crowd and providing that immersive experience of, wow, it's like I'm actually there. And um, that's what viewers want. But in this world, actually more tech sometimes is more problems. And could it be that advances in technology are actually providing maybe a bit of a barrier to what we want to do in terms of storytelling and in terms of offering viewers better content. You know, nowadays we've got, there's, there's more to do than ever, less time than ever, because um, margins are reduced and trucks are being shipped around the country faster and faster. Uh, fundamentally, less resource. Um, but yet still there's this uh, target of personalized um, content more immersive content, maybe even adaptive things. There's more formats than ever. And I was in a truck the other day, the sound supervisor was doing 16 simultaneous mixes. You know, we're getting to the point where this is just too much. And I've, I've got a photo there of a, one of the most posh outside broadcast trucks I've ever been in. But even that is, is still, there is still space and capacity limitations for the things that people want to be doing. And even, you know, there's a lot of talk about what we can do with object audio. And that's something that at Salsa Sound we're really passionate about. But when there are linear broadcasts going on as well, and when we wanted to deliver channel-based content over Stereo 5.1, is it, is it really feasible that we can do this in a, in a current workflow? So is cloud the answer? Can we do better than the status quo? Not just kind of, oh, can we replicate what we do on the ground, but do it in the cloud? Can we actually look at what new opportunities we can leverage. Can we look at the GPU, for example, for more processing power so that we can do more clever stuff um, and talk a bit later about some AI opportunities that I see. Um, maybe there's automation that can happen there and generally creating better mixes for audiences that go a bit further beyond what we've been um, doing as the status quo up to now, making things more immersive, more cinematic. and. Doing things in the cloud means that actually all of the monitoring and um, the QCing can be done in a much nicer environment rather than kind of stuck in the corner of a truck. You could be in a professional standard um, mixing studio and, and creating content uh, and kind of monitoring it in that environment, which is obviously much better, particularly with, with height. But one of the things I'm really interested in and at Salsa we're interested in a lot is what are the opportunities? You know, what are the new things that can be done when you start to view audio production in a cloud context? And so obviously the one that a lot of people talk about remote production, you know, doing, doing more for less and kind of taking that, um, a lot of the kind of on-site infrastructure and porting onto the cloud and, and producing the efficiencies that way. I love all that. Um, I'm interested in the intelligent audio processing. What can we do in terms of automation um, that maybe you couldn't necessarily do if you were just in a traditional workflow, but when you leverage the power of GPU and uh, server compute on the cloud, actually there's a whole load of new automation opportunities because you've just got a bigger grunt um, of processing behind you and more kind of capacity to work with. And so in terms of audio analysis, and um, I like to view microphones more as set more as audio data gatherers rather than as sound devices and actually what is all the, the metadata that can be mined out of those data gatherers so looking at things like speech to text crowd analytics so looking at when and where during the game or during the 
presentation, the crowd is getting the most excited because that's that's actually our best metric for how exciting a match is. So people do kind of think of visual analysis, but actually in the audio, you've got the crowd that this kind of constant metric of telling you how exciting the game is. So looking at the crowd analytics, we've done a lot of work in terms of the um, event tagging. So looking at you know what's what's actually going on in this space, but, but looking at in an audio context, and we'll we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Then a lot of things to, we could do in terms of error detection and pr some processing suggestions, kind of looking at kind of configuring a mix automatically and um, using kind of different presets and kind of you know we suggest with this microphones that actually you use these presets um, and things like that. And then obviously with the cloud, you've got this opportunity of creating multiple different mixes. No longer it has to be, well, we've only got this kind of set of hardware on site, so we can only do these mixes or we can only monitor these ones. Actually, you've got all of a sudden the world's your oyster in terms of the output that you can create. So simultaneously, you could do channel-based content and also next generation objects um, based audio content as well. And then obviously a, a big part of all of this is um, the loudness requirements and how that auto mix is put together because you've got different platforms that have different um, broadcast regulation re requirements, whether that's going out on a streaming OTT platform or whether it's going out to linear broadcast, depends on what those loudness regulations are that, that need to be complied. So putting that automation again in terms of the the output levels that you're getting is really important. So personalization is something as well that I'm really excited about, it's giving viewers the ability to actually manipulate their audio scene, to pan sources around, to change the relative levels of things, maybe increase the level of the dialogue. And obviously object-based audio is, is, is essential to that, um, looking at kind of Dolby Atmos or MPEG-H so that you can provide the tools for people to customize their own scene with their own preferences. But obviously that's something that's very difficult to do in a traditional context where capacity is already stretched. So the cloud can really leverage that. And where you take that to kind of even more of an extreme looking kind of web three context or like the metaverse, if you like, and kind of how do we do volumetrics? How do we allow people to have those personalized um, AR or XR experiences? Um, you know, maybe watching a match in, in 360 or something like that. And the audio side of that's essential because we are having to kind of give people as many cues as possible to buy into that experience and, and feel like they're there. Um, and I want to talk through to some of the practicalities that, that we've looked at and a, and a project that we've worked at that's actually kind of moving towards that, that kind of area. And the cloud is obviously a, a significant portion of that. So um, this is our kind of um, AI based audio mixing diagram, if you like. Um, so this works kind of in, in cloud or on premises actually, but just to kind of give you a flavor of what we're doing. So microphones at the event go into our AI driven object detection. Now this is listening out based on some templates for specific audio characteristics, whether that's kind of a racket strike in tennis or a ball kick or a whistle blow um, or speech, that kind of thing. And then it goes through an audio extractor and a mixing engine. Um, and also does a localization. You can see we're doing kind of a, a basic triangulate, well, it's basic, it's complicated, it's brilliant, uh, triangulation um, between the, the time of arrival at all the different microphones so that we can get um, a localization, an object type as well. And that provides us with a metadata description of what's going on in the scene in terms of what the sounds are, where they are, and enables us to build up a picture that can create an object-based stream that could then be mixed to a in linear context or also kept as a, an object-based package so that viewers or the end user can, can manipulate that content. So what does that look like in the cloud? Well, some people at the moment are using kind of Reaper in the cloud. We've gone away from that and gone towards a more native approach. So we're using <coughs> Docker containers um, that can run on the, the major cl cloud platforms. So again, we have our um, microphone set up on premises, then we have like a ST2110 30 contribution or our own TMP um, contribution network or, or whatever flavor <coughs> you like. Um, <clears throat> and then 
that goes obviously up to the cloud and to our audio interface, de-embed that audio, and then that's where that um, real-time AI analysis and inferencing comes in based on the audio templates. And we create that kind of um, that object-based representation, which can then be downmixed. And then you can have any number of different outputs with different flavors and um, even allow viewers to to kind of send their preferences up to the cloud and then pull down their personalized mix. Um, and this is the this is the tool that we've built. It's actually a software tool um, that's kind of Mac or Linux or Windows, if you like, um, but in the cloud runs on uh, in Docker containers so that it can be easily deployed and um, and managed basically on the cloud. So it, this is doing all of the AI mixing, but then also giving tools to pan things around and doing the dynamic range control so that you are confidently producing a great mix no matter what the, the user preferences are and producing those object-based stems, so the immersive crowd and the uh, audio objects as well. So what does this look like in terms of a practical project? We've been working for a couple of years now with um, BT and some other partners in the UK looking at um, doing exactly this. So doing kind of, can we create XR experiences um, for people on domestic devices so that actually we're pushing all of the compute power um, onto the cloud or onto the edge compute so that people can, we're basically democratizing XR experiences. So you don't need a huge server in your living room, um, but actually you can you just receiving um, an, a video and an audio stream to your device and the server's doing all the hard work for you and all you're sending is kind of pose information. Like I'm looking over here, I'm looking over here. Um, and whether that's with your device as a kind of virtual window or with a, a headset on. And so um, this is our diagram. So obviously we've got the kind of the production end, then we've got the 5G uh, contribution up to the cloud and we're running um, Cloud XR platform there where we're doing the kind of the decoding and the creation of the scene. And it's, it's a Unity scene that sits in uh, Cloud XR. And then the end users basically are just sending kind of their pose orientation and their interaction with that scene. That, and then in Cloud XR, that's creating those individualized AV assets, which are then streamed to the individual users over a mech network, so uh, multi-access edge compute, so that um, everybody's getting their own bespoke delivery um, and receiving an XR experience as if they had um, a server in their room, but really the cable is just a big, long 5G network connected up to the, the cloud. So we've got a few use cases I'm just really going to rifle through. So there's a motorsport use case where we've got lots of additional graphics and um, 3D representation of the track and bikes and stuff like that. We've been looking at um, in-stadium as well. So uh, having the ability to overlay graphics in real time, sort of uh, offside lines and kind of uh, set plays and things like that. And um, one that I'll talk about in a minute, looking at 360 football. So we've got three 8K cameras, 360 cameras, and doing the processing of all of that and all of the audio up in the cloud so that people can look in different locations, get a different audio experience and um, depending on where they're sat. Some, um, some uh, building and construction use cases as well in terms of like retail, looking at a car and things like that before you've bought it. And there's obvious applications in the medical world as well. One interesting one we've done is dance, so you're doing dance tuition. Um, so the ability to look at We've got a volumetric capture from condensed reality and the ability to be able to view the dancer from different angles and really see how they're creating those moves, I think is a fascinating one. Um, and finally, boxing. So we've got a three um, a volumetric video of the boxing bout and you can view it um, from different angles and pull up different screen assets and things like that. And obviously for us, the audio is a big part of that to be able to customize that audio experience to match your customized visual experience. And remembering that all of this is being processed um, in the cloud on the edge and delivered as an individualized uh, experience, in this case, over these Nreal glasses. 
So for the audio system, obviously super important that it needs to be immersive. We need to capture that scene in a volumetric audio sense. It needs to be adaptive so that as viewers change their visual perspective, the audio matches up. And a key part is obviously that it's personalized as well. So fitting with that object orientated um, object audio paradigm. So if everybody's getting a different audio mix, obviously we can't have a sound supervisor creating each one of those different mixes. So automation's uh, super important and obviously AI has a key part to play there so that we're automatically extracting all those audio objects, creating that immersive crowd sound and producing multiple mixes simultaneously all in the cloud in real time. And obviously with different mixes, we're going to have to consider different loudness requirements as well and um, you know different mix components and so that's the audio system that we are going to need to create for this so this is our audio setup and um, so we've got the um, all the microphones on premises um, being captured and then streamed up onto the cloud side where we've got our sub mixes being produced and our output groups so all of those um, audio objects and the sound fields and um, also that metadata stream that we've spoken about that gets streamed into the Unity engine along with the um, visual assets to create that um, volumetric scene. And then uh, that's hosted in Cloud XR. And then the clients then um, connect to that. It's got multi-access connection. And then each of those is receiving the audio and video assets um, for their specific viewpoint on that Unity scene with a different kind of um, screens that they have. So in so doing, we've also kind of supporting linear broadcast as well. So because we're capturing and automatically mixing those assets, we can do multiple mixes at once. So some of them get streamed into the Unity engine and then some of them can then be streamed over OTT to um, um, standard delivery, basically. So this is um, the use case that we did. I think I showed a picture of this before. So this is the um, uh, at Wolves um, against Brentford earlier on this season. And we've actually got three different sound field microphones and then all of the, the standard broadcast mics as well. So that the three different sound fields um, for that sort of immersive audio, they go hand in hand with the 8K 360 cameras that we had at three locations um, from BT Sport. And then the idea was that viewers could decide which of those 360 cameras they wanted to kind of view the game from and or the highlights from or um, you know just kind of get a different perspective on the game but we wanted to provide them with a different audio stream then depending on what they're actually looking at so a different audio persp perspective to match the different visual perspectives and with it being captured in ambisonics we did a binaural rendering so that even as you rotate your head the sounds rotate around you and the on-pitch sound and um, the AI-driven sort of on-pitch object also is locked to the, loca the correct location on the pitch as well. So that was our, our mic setup um, and this is um, proof that it was actually real and that's that's us with the control GUI um, that we showed earlier um, defining how that processing is done in the cloud. And then here we've got, uh, this is actually what the the view the viewers had access to. So this is one of the 360 um, camera locations and you can see you've got the ability to, to change different audio attributes there, whether you want to be spatialized um, and whether you want to have, which kind of, do you want the crowd sort of, um, kind of fan experience sound or the more kind of broadcasty sound um, and kind of uh, an option to choose different commentary feeds and things like that. So really cool use case again all needs to be done in the cloud because it's personalized and um, this is kind of some heavyweight processing going on that we don't want to completely drain people's batteries and kind of cost them uh, a fortune in that sense of having to have the best possible phone in order to to do this so utilizing their gpu is important in the cloud um, we've also been doing some really good stuff at the moment with boxing um, so we've got this, um, if you can see this diagram, we've got the Octo mic, which is a, actually a second order ambisonics mic that we hung right over the very center of the ring. And what that's able to do is as well as capture the immersive crowd, we're actually able to steer virtual microphone beams around to any point in the ring. 
um, so we can capture the ring sounds as well as that immersive uh, crowd, which means that we can put together a really great audio, volumetric audio picture that matches our volumetric video picture so that no matter what your visual perspective is, we can create uh, a corresponding audio perspective. And we've done one at Royal Albert Hall here, and then we've also just got back from doing another great event uh, in Wembley, which was which was fun. So hopefully that has whet your appetite that the cloud is your oyster for doing new audio things, not just maintaining the status quo, but actually going beyond and providing viewers with new experiences um, that and I think that's that's the future of where we want to go with audio. Brilliant, Rob. Thank you so much. Thank you ever so much for that. Now, unfortunately, Ethan's unable to join us for the Q&A. So thank you very much. And actually looking at the um, questions that um, I've got to ask you, I think they're pretty much all for you anyway. So um, so ready with question number one. You mentioned the 5G Edge XR project, which sounds really cool. You have a fan. Tell us more about that and when you think this kind of thing will be available to viewers. Yeah, nice. Um, so yeah, the, the 5G Edge XR project, it's a UK government project. Um, so it's a DCMS funded project and we've been having a lot of fun with it, really doing volumetric video. So we've teamed up with BT um, and Condensed Reality and the Grid Factory dance east and um what we the, the idea is to kind of democratize xr experiences so you don't need to have the best phone in the world to be able to kind of have a xr experience or to have like even the best headset or and a huge server in your room to do all the number crunching actually we're hosting a, a unity scene in the cloud and so all the device is doing is just kind of sending a message give you know um a viewpoint onto that scene and so we've been working with the audio really to to create a customized audio experience so that it actually matches up with what what viewers are looking at because mm -hmm. it's great having good visuals but if the audio doesn't match then people don't really buy into it so um we've been having a lot of fun particularly with the the boxing and the football i mentioned mentioned in the the presentation and creating those automated and enhanced kind of immersive mixes is is really what gets me out of bed in the morning i love that it's really nice it's that now audio is just as important as the video. It always used to be that it was the poor relation. Um, yeah. And now I think these days, actually, it's almost more important that you get a really good audio experience as well. So it really makes be, it can often be the differentiator. You know, if you send some video, they get a, if you get a glitch in the video, people don't tend to notice. But if the audio goes, <laughs> then absolutely uh, you, know, you get a lot of complaints. So. Uh, yeah, these fans, um, they're serious people, right? So Exactly, yeah. I think okay, the other part of that another question, question. Was, like, when are we going to see this? I, yes. I didn't answer the second part. No, 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 I'm terribly um, sorry, please. And, you know, it's, my, it's me. I, so I, I think we're, we're looking at this being rolled out in the next kind of year, really, year or two okay. years, when we'll start to see these things kind of hitting the mainstream. You know, we, there's so much talk about, Kind of what's going on in the the metaverse and web 3 or whatever you mm -hmm. call it in the virtual worlds that momentum is really moving in this space and seeing a lot of kind of volumetric video capture and um obviously we're working really hard on the volumetric audio capture so that you can if you can watch a game from any angle you can listen to it from any angle as well so yeah i think the future is bright for that and i think it's probably going to be coming in the next sort of year or two nice hopefully. <laughs> Okay, another question. So um, this sounds great for high-end content, but what about the more niche audience? So e.g. the lower sports leagues, which obviously these days actually, they're just as important. And in America, you know, not that they would be lower league, but your college football and everything else. So there's a really, really wide audience for this now. Yeah, I, I think I think that's a really good point. I think that's the, that's the cloud all over, really. It's mm -hmm. kind of... Can we, there's a, always like just a greater and greater appetite for, for new content, you know, people watching, you know, under 23 reserves games, um, you know, women's football in some nations isn't, isn't as big a deal. And so but they want to, to, to kind of push this content um, and it might only be going to a smaller audience. So the, the budgets are obviously massively reduced. And so to be able to do some of that 
processing in the cloud and, and the automation so that you can deploy kind of, you know, one individual at the venue, but you are still producing a really high quality mix um, that's being delivered to those audiences. I think it's really important because it's funny, people who like niche sports still want that really high end Absolutely, uh, you know, yeah. quality. It's not like, oh, because I'm only interested in, you know, Lithuanian volleyball, I expect a bad kind of um, version of it in the UK. No, they expect it to be, you know, the real deal and to, to be a high quality production. So where we can deploy AI to try and improve that and to make sure that everyone's getting a really great experience, whether they're watching the high end or the lower end, I think is really important. And that's, yeah. there's uh, big cost savings to be had and new opportunities to be uh, leveraged by broadcasters, I think. Okay, we've now got more. So um, who, um, who or, no, let me read this. Who or the positions, the name, IT director, editor, etc., are responsible for these practices in your case? Yeah, I mean that, that's it's a, a good point because it's like, this is one of those things where you've got this crossover between audio professionals meets IT professionals, and I think it's kind of a little bit of both. It's kind of audio people yeah. having to learn how to do IT skills and IT people having to learn, all right, this is, this is how you do audio. And, you know, those two worlds are really coming together at the moment. Yeah. And in our case, we're very much uh, an audio company who's, you know, forging our way in the IT world and um, <laughs> pursuing things in the cloud. Thankfully, you know, there's a lot of tools uh, and APIs and things that are available to kind of make life a little bit easier as we transition kind of recognized or you know new audio workflows and get them doing in the cloud but yes i i don't know if i've got the good answer for that i think it's a bit of a bit of both and obviously you, it, they can't survive on their own you need some it experts but you absolutely also need the audio experts as well so that's a sitting on the fence delightfully answer okay we've got more questions this is turning um good and bad um, so, with people's um, auditory acuity changing, sorry, with age, is it possible to customise appropriate to that individual to maximise the quality of their experience throughout life? Wow. I can, uh, yeah, 100%. That is some, something I am, is close to my heart. I think right. it's really important. And I mentioned about the object-based audio and this is what we've needed. You know, it's what we've yeah. needed for, for the last few years. And my, my background's always been in object-based audio and having those individual audio components kept separate right the way throughout so that when they're delivered to the end user, they have control over what they do. So they can, can yeah, you can increase the level of the dialogue. Brilliant. You could even change the EQ on it kind of pull out the frequencies that help you understand the speech a bit more if that was particular yeah. to you or you could you know a, a different example but you could jump in and go oh I actually want the French commentator uh, or the German or, or maybe Absolutely. I want audio description um, yeah. and so having those components separate is is really important and that with the hearing impaired element it's it, it's been proven time and time again you know that you need to boost the level of the dialogue and reduce the background noise and it just massively aids um cognition of the content so definitely definitely very important the viewer experience all round basically i mean that's what's really nice these days we're actually really um we pay attention to everything these days which i think is really yeah. nice I think the other thing that we're working on at the moment is, is related to that, actually, is looking at automated speech to text, um, ah, which okay. I think plays a really key part in uh, obviously kind of current broadcast workflows, but also in a future sense. So looking at um, XR content, if you if it's funny, commentators have a very specific vernacular. It doesn't really <laughs> work very well with a lot of the standard API. So we've been developing something specifically for that use case and then so in the xr you could have like a you can actually have a a graphic with the the text on that you could position any way you like as a 3d object nice it's a little bit more a little bit more dynamic than just hmm. kind of having a little bar of subtitles that scrolls that i always struggle to read absolutely and your kids can do it straight away probably as well 
but they could probably be your <laughs> IT engineers, right? <laughs> yeah, almost definitely, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, another question. How do you ensure sync between the various audio sources and the video? Do you use NTP or something a bit more reliable? Um, so when we do this, typically we do um, ST2110-30 um, to get all the sources up to the cloud. And obviously that's got PTP precision time protocol built in. Uh, we also, Dante has got the, the PTP in it as well. And uh, combined with that, the, the screenshots of the software, the Mixer software that has um, linear time code built into it as well. So that maintains the, the sync with all of our audio sources. And um, if they're recorded assets or if they go out to stream, then we ensure that they're all time locked from what was done at the venue side. And then the PTP enables you to time sync with like your, your cameras and the other the content that's that's going around. But it's always a little bit of a yeah, yeah, a high wire act with the with time <laughs> in, the, in the cloud. And so that's where it's important that kind of you've got variable latencies, you know, uh, that you can dial in or um using other other sort of um, off the shelf timing things that can that can help you resync stuff again okay questions keep coming i'm really sorry about this or oh, it's good yeah. depending on how you look <laughs> take a sip of something right this is all really good however how do you see this working in a group rather than a single viewer watching a football match as an example yeah okay that's that's a good one yeah so uh i think if you're looking in a sort of a vr context it's not really a group activity um, you know, VR is very insular, actually, and you mm -hmm. know, you maybe you want your headphones, you want your your own thing. But what we've what we've been doing is using the um, Nreal AR headsets, which are really really cool if mm. you've ever seen them. And um, so, being an AR headset, you have access to your personal content that's in your virtual world, but then also you you can actually look at people in the real world. Um, and and communicate and they the headphones don't actually go into your ears they're just like little speakers above okay. so in that context actually it works really well because you can create an audio bed that everybody receives and then you can have your personalized audio feed that only you receive so somebody could be in the room getting an audio description whereas somebody else could be getting something different and somebody might like the spanish commentary so that they could be getting different uh, sort of audio overlays, different objects that go over the top of the bed that everybody's getting. And the same okay. with the graphics. You know, you, I might want uh, all of the, the stats of all the, the motorbike that I particularly like, and somebody else might be actually more interested in, like, you know, what's the overall standings at this point in the race or something like that. So there is a lot of scope for people sitting in the same room getting the same content. If you're if you're doing it in an AR context, but wow. but VR is a bit more closed closed book, I think. Wow, that's a totally immersive, different experience again. So you're sitting next to somebody, but you're genuinely having a different version of the same thing. That's, yeah, um... and I think this is this kind of thing felt very clunky a few years ago, but mm. there's just been a dramatic improvement in the devices that enable you to view this content. Um, and those AR glasses are phenomenal. They're becoming more and more just like glasses, basically, um, <laughs> which is which is really cool. Not and in sci-fi movies anymore. Yeah, no. I, I guess the other thing is that this content is also accessible through uh, tablets and, and phones as a sort of a second screen window. Yeah. So the other way that we've envisaged this is having a you know big screen in front of you, but then being able to you know point your device around if you want to 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 kind of get greater insight so we had a a volumetric capture of a, a motorbike that you could actually like bend down and look at and so you can you could do that you don't necessarily have to have the glasses in which case everybody can experience that together that was a barrier of 3d a long time ago wasn't it that sort of you know the glasses and everything else so i think we've learned yeah, a lot from that yeah. So. Yes, I to be honest, I still think it's a bit of a barrier, and yeah. I still think that, uh, but it's getting better. Like whereas in the past you'd you'd get sort of viewer fatigue after about sort of five minutes. Yeah. Now you know we're pushing an hour, so that's yeah. still, we're getting there. I think. 
So do you think we've got five minutes? So this is a com this is a question from me a little bit more. Do you think this is going to be a big topic at NAB this year? I think AI is going to be a big topic, right? Do you, I mean, can you see that this is where we're all going to be actually able to really experience some different stuff for those of us who are going off? Yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, I'll be there talking about it. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> I would have at least one person. But yeah, I'll see to you me, there. this is, yeah. <laughs> I think for me, this is the next, it is the next big thing. There's been a lot of noise. I mean, even in the mainstream press about yeah. the metaverse and you're seeing more and more. I mean, I've been seeing uh, lots of kind of uh, stadiums in the metaverse cropping up recently, a couple out in the US and Manchester mm -hmm. City out here in, in the UK. And so it, people are jumping on it quite quickly. And I think, mm -hmm. yes, NAB is going to feature quite a lot of this as people as broadcasters and content providers want to kind of get the get one over on everyone else and kind of show their their usp -ish and uh, yeah give a more of a, a use case for people excellent oh my gosh i think another question has just come in okay what is the highest number of audio sources being collected in a project so far oh that's putting you on the screen <laughs> <laughs> um that's a great question so we had um we had 63 so I almost maxed out my 64 channel card so that that's Ouch. quite a few um, so that that was all of our microphones and all of the broadcast feeds as well so that we that was that was quite a few and that that octo mic I mentioned in the boxing that's yeah. in itself is eight channels and we we did actually do one that's probably more than 63 channels thinking about it. There's quite a few years ago. And we use something called the Eigen mic, which is a fourth order ambisonics mic. It's got 32 capsules in it. So each, Whoa. It, it just, it's like a tennis ball, but it's got 32 microphones in it. Wow. So uh, you can imagine that soon ramps up if you've got one or two Gosh, of them. Gosh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but they were quite difficult to process. So that's why we went down the, the idea of having well, the, the second order ambisonics from an immersive perspective, perspective rather, tends yeah. to give the best bang for the buck. So eight microphones give this real uh, detailed sense of the audio picture so you can localise sources all around you. Right. Gosh, we have three minutes to go. Um, and do you know what I was thinking about half an hour ago? We were probably done and these questions keep coming. You'll be really pleased to know there's no more questions right now. Um, oh, poor old Ethan um, missed out. But if um, anybody actually does want to ask Ethan any questions, rather than putting poor old Rob in the spot speak all the time, um, then um, obviously you can get hold of us um, at the RTS um, and we'll be pleased to um, pass on any of those questions to him. Well, Rob, this has been amazing. Thank you. I feel you and I have just had a really nice chat. So yeah. I really appreciate Always. it. <laughs> um, and hopefully we can carry this on at NAB as well. Um, but I'd just like to say thank you to you um, and thank you to our audience who have actually stayed with us for this entire period. Um, yeah, yeah. So I know, well done, yeah. you kept their attention. Yeah. Um, all that remains to me is have a lovely evening, Rob and everybody else. And thank you very much for your time. Good night.